Good morning. Organ transplantation, I would suggest to you, was one of the major successes of modern medicine in the second half of the last century, saving many thousands of lives and transforming and extending many thousands of others. Now, if when I was a child, and that was just a few decades ago, I developed kidney failure or liver failure, I would have had no chance of making it to adulthood. But today, organ transplantation is the treatment of choice for end-stage failure of kidney, liver, heart, lung, pancreas in all major medical centers around the world. It is a success story. However, it's not perfect. And it's limited by three issues that I want to mention to you. The first is that the success that we can celebrate requires transplant patients every day for the whole of their life with their transplant to ingest drugs that depress the immune system in a completely indiscriminate manner. And as a consequence, the transplant patient is susceptible to a range of infections and has an increased risk of cancer. The second limitation is because while the short-term success rates are really impressive and so much better than when I first qualified in medicine, so now uh, a kidney transplant from a deceased donor uh, will last, 90% uh, of them will be functioning well at 12 months. But after you pass that first year point, there's a steady attrition of those transplants over time, so that the average length of time that a kidney transplant from a deceased donor works is around 12 years. The third limitation is quite simply that supply cannot meet demand. And even if every usable organ was transplanted, and of course, sadly, that is not the case currently, but even if it was, there are not enough organs to go round. And so tragically, in the UK, hundreds of patients every year die while waiting for a transplant because their transplant doesn't arrive in time. Now, as an aside, I do hope that you've all signed an organ donor card you may know that in a year's time from now, the law in the UK is changing, and so we're moving from an opt-in to an opt-out system. But for the next 12 months, uh, signing your organ donor card is really important. And I strongly recommend it to you for another reason, and that is that it seems to guarantee you immortality. <laughs> so for all the hundreds of thousands of people that have signed kidney and organ donor cards, no one who dies is carrying an, a, a donor card. I suspect that's because it's buried in the bottom of the sock drawer rather than being in the wallet where it should be. But do sign uh, your donor card. Now, the major obstacle to successful transplantation and the obstacle that causes those limitations I've described to you is, of course, the immune system. The immune system objects violently when it's confronted by a large mass of foreign proteins being inserted into the body and does its best to reject it. But just imagine if it was possible to make the immune system selectively blind to the transplant and leaving it intact to defend the patient against infections and against cancer, wouldn't that be a great thing? Indeed, it would address all three of the limitations that I've described to you because by definition, the patient wouldn't need to take those drugs that depress the immune system in a blanket manner for experimental models, because you can achieve this selective blindness, referred to as immune tolerance, uh, in experimental animals, the transplants would last for longer. And that, in turn, would address the third issue, because particularly in the kidney field, when a patient's transplant fails, they go back onto dialysis on the waiting list. And so waiting lists are populated with many patients waiting for their second or even their third transplant, making the supply-demand ratio adverse. Now, before you think that I'm losing touch with reality and going into a fantasy world, let me uh, show you a painting. This is a painting by an Italian Renaissance artist called Fra Angelico, painted in the 16th century. The original is hanging in an art gallery in Florence. In my view, it's a beautiful painting, but it's also an interesting painting uh, from one or two points of view. What it's depicting is a young man in the early church receiving a limb transplant, supposedly from an Ethiopian donor, hence the color of the skin. And the surgeons are the patron saints of modern medicine, Saints Damien and Cosmos. 
But if I ask you to contrast this with a modern-day operating theater, which you may not have seen in real life, but you've likely seen in film or on television, what would you say are the major differences between what you're looking at here and the modern day? You might say, well, the operating table looks rather primitive, which indeed it does. You might point out that there's no anesthetist. Good point. You might point out there's no intravenous infusion to deal with blood loss. Another very good point. But I submit to you that the biggest difference between this, then, and now is that the two surgeons have halos. <laughs> now, I've had the pleasure of working with many surgeons in my life, and I respect them enormously. They're great people, but I've yet to meet a surgeon with a halo. But really what this painting is about is optimism. And the reason I say that is that the operating theater assistant has put two shoes beside the operating table, therefore imagining this young man was going to walk away on two legs. <laughs> Limb transplantation would not have worked then, and it doesn't work today. So this was a case of extreme optimism. And what I want to persuade you of in the next few minutes is that there are grounds for optimism in delivering what I just mentioned, of creating a state of selective blindness or immune tolerance in transplantation. The reason underlying this optimism is that in recent years, we've acquired enormous insights into how to turn the immune system on and off at will. And this ability to manipulate immunity is having many benefits in many fields of medicine, probably most particularly in the field of cancer. And if you think about it, cancer and transplantation are really two sides of the same coin. Because in cancer, the challenge is to persuade the immune system to attack something that it is inclined to ignore. In transplantation, we want to persuade the immune system to ignore something that it's inclined to attack. And so discoveries in one field very often have a read across uh, into the other. And of course, there are other unwanted immune responses other than transplantation that we would like to turn off selectively. Uh, another one is allergy, a pretty useless immune response, which many of you may suffer from in one form or another. And the third, of course, is autoimmunity, when the immune system becomes self-aggressive, underlying many chronic long-term diseases, such as multiple sclerosis and diabetes. Now, something that I suspect many of you may never have thought about is the extraordinary ability, capacity, that your immune system has to discriminate between you and your proteins and the proteins made by bacteria, viruses, and fungi. That ability is something on which your life depends. And the reason it's remarkable is that there's nothing categorically different between your proteins and the proteins made by a bacteria. They're simply strings of amino acids. But your immune system, most, for most of us, most of the time, manages to live in peace, love, and harmony with you and your proteins, and then zone in on the needle in the haystack when you get an infection and eradicate the infection. It is remarkable. And one of the key mechanisms responsible for this ability is mediated by a small population of white blood cells called regulatory cells. They exist in every species that, that has been studied, and they are essential to prevent autoimmunity. The evidence for that is if you engineer a mouse by genetically modifying it so that it cannot make these regulatory cells, those mice get multiple autoimmune phenomena. A small number of human families have been identified with consanguineous marriages where the children have a mutation in a gene that's vital to the development of these regulatory cells. And those children get multiple autoimmune uh, diseases also. So they are vital. And with that information, we asked a very simple-minded question. Might it be possible to isolate this vital population of regulatory cells and hijack them and divert their attention to turn off selectively the immune response to a transplant. So we started off, uh, typically, in a mouse model, and we isolated these regulatory cells, we expanded them ex vivo, and then we infused them back into the mouse while it was being given a heart transplant from another strain that it would normally reject. And sure enough, they're capable of preventing rejection in that mouse context. So to get closer to the clinic, we then used what's called a humanized mouse model. So this is where you take a mouse and you engineer it genetically so it has no immune system of any kind. 
and as a consequence, it will accept a piece of transplanted human tissue and not reject it. So in our case, we transpl transplanted small pieces of human skin uh, provided by the plastic surgeons onto these mice, allowed the skin to bed in for several weeks, so you then had a healthy piece of human skin sitting on a mouse, and then we'd infuse into the mouse human uh, immune cells that would reject the skin, and indeed they did, and that allowed us to ask the question, if we at the same time put in regulatory cells, would it be able to prevent rejection? And sure enough, they could. So here was evidence, albeit in a highly, highly manipulated model, that these human regulatory cells could prevent rejection of human tissue mediated by human aggressor cells. Now, there's one key elaboration of this approach, which, again, we're adopting from the cancer field, and that is to genetically modify the injected regulatory cells to target their attention to the transplant. So what's been done, and it's happening now in clinical trials in cancer, is to, in cancer, of course, you're using aggressor cells, not regulatory cells, is to genetically insert into the aggressor cells a gene that encodes a receptor that comes out on the cell surface and targets the aggressor cells to the cancer. So in our case, we then genetically modified our regulatory cells, allowing them to express a receptor that targeted their attention to the transplant, and that made them 10 times more efficient. So with all those data, we approached the regulatory authorities, the MHRA, and sought permission to indulge in or engage in clinical trials. And we've now just completed two phase one trials. A phase one trial, you may understand, is a safety trial, not an efficacy trial. We've done phase one trials in kidney transplant patients and liver transplant patients, and the good news is the safety profile is extremely good, and indeed there's a hint of efficacy in both patient populations. So we're now poised to move on to efficacy trials, and we will be using genetically modified regulatory cells with their attention targeted to the transplant antigens. Now, I hope you agree that that's looking pretty exciting. But I want in the final minutes to introduce another field of medical research that may make everything I've said so far redundant, may make transplant surgeons redundant and transplant physicians such as myself redundant. And that's the field of regenerative medicine. Now, you've probably heard of stem cells and the possibility of using stem cells to culture tissues that then can be used for tissue repair. So for simple tissues like cartilage and skin, that is indeed possible and that is happening. It's even possible to culture mini organs, they're called organoids, and this has been done with mini kidneys in experimental models. So it may be possible to generate mini organs for transplantation. And of course, if those stem cells are derived from the patient themselves, then you're circumventing the immune response problem because the tissue essentially will be regarded as self. So that is very interesting and has promise. But there's an even more exciting field that has been opened up by the study of this character on the slide now, the zebrafish. Now, zebrafish are remarkable because if you cut a piece out of the zebrafish's heart and then stitch it up, the heart of the zebrafish will repair itself. It will regrow heart tissue uh, and restore the heart to normal size and function, something that doesn't happen in mammals. But if it can happen in a zebrafish, surely it can be made to happen in mammalian species. And so there are one or two groups around the world, one of which is at King's College London, led by a very talented Italian researcher, Mauro Giacca, who is exploring exactly this. And so Mauro's model is starting off again in mice, inducing a heart attack in mice by cutting off a blood supply to the heart muscle wall, which would normally lead to a scar tissue and a malfunctioning heart. And then by manipulating the pattern of gene expression around the damaged tissue, He's persuading the heart muscle cells to start to, to divide, which they normally don't do, and to repair that piece of damaged heart and replace the scar tissue with healthy tissue. He's done it in mice. Getting closer to the clinic, he's done it in a pig model. It works. So now, of course, the intention is to move this into the clinical setting and see if we can achieve this in situ repair uh, in patients. So in closing, let me urge you, sign your do organ donor cards, talk to your loved ones about what you want to happen to your organs after you die. 
but I hope I've managed to transmit to you some of the excitement in this field of transplantation and the possibility of transplant tolerance, and even more, the possibility of tissue repair, so that looking ahead in the next two decades, our approach to organ failure will be sub substantially more sophisticated, successful, and widely applicable than it is today. Thank you.